This podcast is a part of the Podmania Podcasting Network. Check out podmania.co.uk to check out more of our great podcasts, features, reviews, match ratings and previews spanning the crazy and diverse world of professional wrestling. guys and welcome to a brand new episode of the stardom cast your monthly audio source of all things world wondering stardom right here on the pod mania podcasting network i am your host rob good i'm joined as ever on these episodes by chris o'brien chris how are you tired i didn't sleep very well last night oh why i just didn't you know how sometimes you just can't sell too hot well, yeah, actually, it's surprisingly hot considering I'm in Scotland. <laughs> it never gets above 12 degrees in Scotland. What are you on about? No, last week I went down to Birmingham last year um, to see my friend and it got up to fucking 30 degrees and I was melting. <laughs> like, we we just got up one day and I turned to her going, can we please just go somewhere with air conditioning? Can we, like, just hang out at a shopping centre all day, please? It's brilliant that when people say, especially in this country um that oh yeah we're going we're going down south for holiday and to to most people that means cornwall but to you it meant birmingham that's amazing well i was i was saying i had to explain to an american the other day that i'm not in the north i'm in scotland the north is south of me <laughs> you are too north to be north yeah no i'm in the, i'm in the south of scotland i'm in the south <laughs> All right, good. Anyway, um, right. So today, ladies and gentlemen, a couple of different things on this episode to how we usually do things. Obviously, it's been released on a Monday and not a Sunday. I'll tell you why that is in a moment. We're also not just doing the Corican show that was on the 17th of July because there was two Shinkiba shows on the 11th and the 12th of July, which had Huge ramifications on this Corican show and the next Corican show as well. So we're going to run through those as well. Um, and there was a match of the year candidate, in my humble opinion, as well on night two. Uh, we're going to answer some of your questions, uh, which you've given us on our Discord channel, on Twitter and on Facebook. So we'll get to those shortly as well. And then we'll look ahead to what stardom has to bring us in the coming days and months. So obviously. Um, Stardom had their Corican show, their Exploding Summer show, on the 17th of July. And we wanted to do this on Sunday. But the thing is, Stardom, it's one of the few things that irks me about this promotion, is that they upload it match by match. And uh, come Sunday, when we wanted to record, not enough of the matches have been uploaded to Stardom World. So we've waited until today, and the vast majority are on there. Um, There's two matches we're not going to be able to review, because obviously we haven't seen them yet. Um, and they're the two undercard tags, Donna Del Mundo defeating Tokyo Cyber Squad and Mayu and Starlight defeating Azumi and Momo. Um, we'll get to them a little bit more when we get onto the Corrigan show, but just so you know, we, we haven't seen them yet, so I don't know anything about them. Um, Chris, yes. before we start, um, I think it is important that we talk about this little piece of news. So Crazy Pete on our Discord actually brought this up as a question um, a couple of days ago about whether uh, the team of B and Jamie Hayter should be stripped of the championships. And um, in my head, I was like, mm, I can I can sort of see why, because even if this pandemic clears up, I don't know how long it's going to be before international air travel. It will be, it'll be a lot a longer before... Jamie's allowed in the country than it will be for B, so, you know, maybe. But also in my head, I was thinking, well, think about how many times that Rio's defended the high-speed championship. Um, and then all of that was rendered completely irrelevant because this morning, B and Jamie were stripped of the goddesses of stardom championship. So, Chris, we'll talk about the match that's going to decide our new goddesses of stardom champions shortly when we get to the future shows, but... I just wanted to ask you, do you think this is the right decision? Um, yes and no. Like, 
I do definitely agree, like, some championships just don't get defended. But also, we don't know how long it's going to be. And, like, for tag team championship, it's not like for high speed championships, which is fairly irregular, just gets thrown on random small shows. Um, the tag title does get defended fairly often. So you need that. And especially since you're trying to build a couple of new tag teams through some of the storylines you're telling, it's, it's kind of necessary right now. Although, also, I wouldn't be surprised if part of this, because we haven't stripped Jamie of the SWA belt, have they? No, but again, you've said, you know, the goddesses of stardom championships are a fairly high sort of priority championship where the SWA championship isn't. Because I was going to ask you about that, but I thought, nah, they probably won't strip her of that yet. Yeah, but and also, like, B does have a tiny amount of baggage. Well, I say it has a fair right now. Like, I think she'll be pretty much black ball from Brit Res right now. So... It's it, it's it's dicey, but like Stardom might have thought we might want to take this off with, like and maybe wait for this to blow over because like Stardom and like a lot of Japanese companies don't really seem to bother themselves with like other companies. um drama. Yeah, like you saw how much longer Al stayed on with New Japan, for example, and how he still wrestles for Noah sometimes. No, no, fair enough. Um, obviously, we'll talk about um the match that was announced today for, I believe, the next Corrigan show. Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. We'll talk about who we think should win. And uh, yeah, we'll go into those cards in a little bit more depth. But let's delve straight in because after all, we have got three shows to get through because Stardom have decided to completely saturate us with more wrestling. Um, so let's start with the Shinkiba show on the 11th of July uh, in front of 140 people. Both these shows were in front of 140 people. Um, Similar to the Stardom is Again show, um, the cards weren't announced prior. So for these two shows, we had the unit promos where they were all done at the start. Um, This first one, just a couple of notes. Uh, Jungle Kiona is back and will be in action. Uh, Awida Tai just refused to comment. Um... Donna Del Mundo talk about the various ways that they're going to crush their opponents. Apart from Shuri, who talked about her brand new attire and how excited she is, especially when Julia mentioned that it looked like the universe. And instantly, I just fell in love with Shuri. I think she's great. And she's quickly becoming one of my favourites in stardom. (laughs) You've done an absolute 180 on her. 100%, yeah. I I have no issue saying that. My, My biggest thing with her was that noise that she made at the Cinderella tournament. But since I've made that point, she hasn't done it. And in the singles match on night two, it was it was basically non-existent. So I can get over that. I think she's fucking great. I love her. I think she's great. Um, and then finally, we had stars. Uh, Hannon is hoping to return on her birthday, which is the 11th of August. And Tam is still pissed off with Julia after the fact that her eye still hasn't healed after three weeks. And Mayu is looking for a red belt rival. Ooh, foreshadowing. Um, don't know what that was. But yeah, those were the opening <laughs> unit promos. <laughs> Have you ever watched Yu-Gi-Oh? No, I haven't. You sound like Pegasus from Yu-Gi-Oh. Those people that watch um, that watch Yu-Gi-Oh tell me that I sound like Pegasus. Um, is there anything else you want to add about that, Chris? Um, no, not really. Fair enough. <laughs> um, so we opened with. So last time we spoke to you, we had a Queen's Quest tag team match, um, which was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and this time they decided that they were going to do something very similar. So we had a Top- Tokyo Cyber Squad tag team match um, with Death Yamasan and Rina taking on Jungle and Konami. Um, Chris, what did you think of this match? I enjoyed it. Like, it's essentially just there, I think, to get um, Jungle Kiona re acclimatized. Like, it's an easy one. You were just working with your mate, so you're just sort of doing shit. Because she didn't do do a ton in this match. So I think it was literally just to get a reacclimatized in front of a crowd, because after this, in terms of storyline, she sort of shoved into the deep end. Um, But yeah, I enjoyed it. There's nothing especially amazing. I I still enjoy Def Yamasan, even if it is the same joke over and over again. (laughs) 
<laughs> Do you know what, though? Genuinely, I'm glad you brought up Death Yamasan because this was genuinely the best I've seen her in the very short amount of time I've been watching Stardom. There was a moment where she did a dropkick senton combo, which I quite liked. Um, I, it's it's a goofy gimmick. It's always going to be a goofy gimmick. It, I just need to accept that. And genuinely, the last couple of shows I have found are quite entertaining. So, um, did surprise me that Konami got the victory here and not Jungle, though. Yeah, maybe it's to sort of surprise you more with the challenge on Night 2. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. And also, Konami is going into a tournament, so this is, like, both Kiona and Konami needed wins, and, like, Kiona, and, like, Konami, and Kiona had an opportunity for a win the next day, because, like, Defi Amazon and Rina aren't exactly a big victory, so... <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. Uh, Konami getting the win over Rina with the Triangle Lancer at 7 minutes and 4 seconds. Fairly standard match. I gave it 5 stars. Yeah, I gave it 5 out of 10. Nothing nothing special. No. Um, so we then moved on to our second match, which was another tag team match between the Stars team of Tam Nakano and Saya Ida taking on the Queen's Quest team of Yutami Hayashita and Saya Kamatani. I am a big big, big fan of the dynamic between Utami and Tall Sire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's basically a standard bruiser and, like, Batista and Rey Mysterio, shit like that, and I'm into that. Definitely into that. Um, I'm also into, I'm also loving Sire Eater right now, like, of all the, like, rookies, with not including the children, because you can't really fairly judge children, but, like, in terms of, like, the rookies, so, like, her, um, Micah, and um, Tall Sire, Saeed is probably my favourite. She's like... I, I think I put in the group chat and Garth was probably looking at that going, what the fuck did I just read? But Saeed is going to like evolve into Ishii one day. Yeah, she's certainly going... She's certainly that sort of ilk, isn't she? She's a sort, a sort of a compact bruiser type and that's that becomes clear the more you come to watch her over these three shows. Um, I'll be honest, I thought she should have won uh, the future of Stardom Bell, but that's a conversation for later on. Um, she's the one with the character out of those rookies, I think is important, because Saya Kamatani, we, we waxed lyrical about how good she was in that tag match for Queen's Quest. She was great in this match as well. I thought this match was great. But, you know, she is... At the moment, she's ultimately... She's the pin eater for Queen's, Queen's Quest. That's sort of her role at the moment. Whereas Sayurida is sort of that resilient, won't-go-away sort of, you know, bruiser. Sort of a smaller version of a Utami, almost. And sort of that character, that gorilla power, she's got that sort of character that, especially tall Sire, doesn't quite have. Yeah, but that's the problem. Like, tall Sire is flashy but she doesn't have pop whereas Ida isn't flashy but like all her moves pop like you you feel the chops you feel the forearms she's just good at the basic stuff she does yeah absolutely she was certainly channeling her inner kabashi with those chops <laughs> um, <laughs> um Utami continues to just blow me away with just how little time she's actually been wrestling and how she looks like just she's the center of attention whenever she's in the ring she just feels like a main event person already you know she's been what wrestling for just over two years it's it's baffling because you look at her and she instantly just draws the eye her lariats everything just seems stiff and seem great she almost killed Saya Ida with her lariat that led to the end um but I'm just I'm a huge huge fan of Yutami. Yeah, she's great. Of course she's great. Um, just, yeah, again, there's not much else she can say. Just the amount of time she's been wrestling and she's only gone from strength to strength. And I can honestly say that for most people on this roster, they're all just, it's such a young roster and we're improving all the time. Uh, it speaks volumes that Tam Nakano is probably the most other person in Stardom and we haven't mentioned her yet. <laughs> <laughs> she did do the greatest cocky pin in the world where she just lay on top of Tall Saya and put her head in her hands and like looked at the camera, which I thought was brilliant. It takes cocky pin to an all new level, that did. Yeah, um, I kind of like Tam when she's not being a face. <laughs> well, she sort of tread she sort of trod the line over these three shows as to, you know, face, all out face, heel, or just 
absolute fucking batshit mental, which she was in the main event of Corrigan. Ah, oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, as for this match, uh, Utami hits a bridging German suplex at 13.32 on Ida to win. I, like I said, I'm a huge fan of the Utami and Kamatani dynamic, or the Utami Tami. Doesn't quite work, does it? We need a name for them. We need a name. Um, I gave it seven stars. Uh, I gave it um, high six or seven, yeah. Yeah, works. Brilliant. So we then moved on to a singles match between Shuri and Starlight Kid. This was exactly what I said I wanted after the main event of Stardom is again, because they had such great chemistry before. Yeah. Um, again, I think Shuri would work fairly well in the high-speed division if we have nowhere else to put her right now. Um, but also, like, I quickly want to address Starlight Kid because, like, my biggest problem with Starlight Kid has always been her offense is fairly weak, but she is addressing that. Oh my god, does she address that? Oh, yeah, definitely. She's since the Cinderella tournament and that match against Momo, which I must come back to once an episode, um, that she just seems to have gone from, like, say, strength to strength. She seems to be keeping up, not keeping up, she's always kept up, but the offense seems to be hitting more. It seems to be stiffer and it seems to be stronger and it seems to be more believable. Because before, if you'd have had a match with Suri and Starlight Kid, you just thought, Suri's going to squash it. But here, there was there was a very, very clear dynamic and they worked really, really well together. And that is definitely, you know, to do with Starlight Kid developing more of a brutish offense, definitely. Yeah, and she sort of started um, like knowing how to actually cut people off. So like she'll drop kick the leg to sort of cut people's momentum off. But and it's not like the limbs are, and she's just doing it to go off the momentum and then do her normal moves. Um, she's not going to do anything amazingly blow away for a while, I think. But like she's still what? What? She's eighteen years old, I think. Um, yeah. I I can't find an age on cage match, and I don't want to. Ha- and I don't want to go down the internet looking for that. But yeah, she's. Super young, so she definitely has time to get better. But Shuri here loves it. Like this is what she needs. She needed like a good single showcase because like a problem with a lot of Donna Del Mondo is that so again lost in the sort of six man tag. It's basically a problem LJ had for the longest time, where like so many of them constantly in six man tags and never had the opportunity to shine. It's very difficult to develop a character in a six-man or a six-woman tag. I completely agree with you because you are very restricted on the amount of time that you are in the ring. Um, and I think this here, you'd got Starlight Kid who, you know, despite developing, as we've spoken about, more of a driven offense, um, she was still trying that flashy shit. And Suri was literally, it was it, she was just no nonsense. There was one moment where um, Starlight Kid went for a, I think a springboard crossbody, and literally Siri caught her and just dropped her on the floor. As though to go, <laughs> the fuck is this? <laughs> what the fuck is this? Um, you bring this. <laughs> um, Starlight's tornado DDT and swinging netbreaker were absolutely amazing. So crisp, so impactful. Really, really, really impressed. Um, and then she developed that resilience as well because she kicked out, especially in that closing sequence she kicked out of a lot of Suri's offense so that resilience mm-hmm. and that sort of you know because she like you've mentioned she is very young and I don't want to say she's perceived as weak because she isn't but you know she's a smaller person therefore you automatically assume you know she's going to get squashed by the bigger characters but here that resilience was very 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 clear and Suri had to do a lot to defeat Starlight Kid, which was excellent, which she did in 10 minutes 19 with the Suzuka. I, again, really, really, really enjoyed this match. I gave it a high 7. I gave it a 7 as well. Just an enjoyable little showcase match for Shuri. I'm looking forward to what she can do when she actually has stakes. Yeah, absolutely. She, along with um, Utami and uh, just a, a couple of other people, she's the one I've got my eye on. When the five star rolls around, I look forward to seeing more of what she can do. Yeah. So we then go into another tag team match with the team of Mayu and Riho taking on the Queen's Quest team of Momo and Azumi. Um, Chris, I believe you have thoughts on Rio. I, I don't like you in Starter. <laughs> okay, why? Um, well, first of all, she's taken a belt off. TV for a year. 
Yeah, okay, I, I get that. Aside from aside from snaffling the belt, because I know this was the issue you had with Chris Jericho in New Japan. Yeah, and Cody, and well, basically Jericho and Cody. Um, but also, like, she has the same problem with Starlight Kid, um, Kid had, where her offense is weak, like it's flashy, but it's weak. And I don't know, especially next to Momo and May. It looks incredibly weird. And even next to Azumi, who like isn't known for like hard hitting offense, but like I don't know, it felt like Rio was struggling to keep up with Azumi, who's only like what seventeen years old. So I don't know. I think I like Renee W because it's like oh, this like sort of flash of a style I enjoy in an American promotion. It's a little wee novelty, but like she, I don't, I just don't find her believable in the context of stardom. Which is weird because I've seen her go get, go up against Nyla Rose and be believable, but like here I'm just sort of like, is it bring your daughter to work day? What the fuck is she doing here? <laughs> see, I see where you're coming from. I do see where you're coming from, but when you go from a promotion where effectively you haven't been on the card for God knows how long, it's difficult to find your place in that, especially in that first match, which I think is where she struggled a little bit here. Um, I think on later showings, certainly at the match at Corican, she was a lot better. Um, but I think rather than it not being able to keep up, I mean, for a start, look who you're in the fucking ring with, Mayu, Azumi, and Momo, three of the quickest in stardom. Um, but I think it's more a case of struggling to find where she fit in. Because don't forget, she's also not got a faction. She's homeless so she hasn't got the team sort of dynamic that you know say azumi and momo or utami and saya had she hasn't got that with mayu i know she's sort of a fringe member of stars or an honorary member of stars but she hasn't got that and i think that sort of impacts it as well i guess um i know i think i literally just have bias because i do enjoy high speed um high speed matches and she sort of took that away, which, like, on one hand is fine, but, like, it didn't translate to more opportunities for Azumi or um, Starlight, so... See, I, I do see what you mean, but the opening salvo between Azumi and Riho... Yeah, because it was high-speed... It was a high-speed one, and high-speed tile matches don't have sort of the stiff strikes you sort of expect from Stardom. It's all, like, quick roll-up as fast as you can, get the salvo as quick as you can. It's weird because I, I know that other promotions have um, high speed divisions, and from what I'm told, they have like actual real sets. Like when you knock someone down, you have to hit the ropes before you pin them. And there's like a really short time limit where Stardom's just sort of like, it's high speed, be fast. Oh no, I, I don't want that. I just, yeah, exactly. It's it's a match where you're just quick, that's all it needs to be. You don't need to add more gimmicks to it. Um, mm, honestly, a short time limit would help it, to be honest. Here, something that I noticed was Mayu was taking childish delight in torturing Momo. I mean, she shushed, <laughs> she shushed the crowd so that they could hear the kick she delivered to Momo's back, then surfed on her back after falling off the first time. Surfed on her back like just... She was being the biggest dickhead heel I've ever seen. When, when um, Mayu had Momo in a... Um, submission lock, look at hold, and she sort of posed behind Rio. <laughs> and the look on Mei's face when the referee starts counting, she's like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> it was it was great, and I wonder if that is to. Well, well, I've got thoughts behind that, but we'll get into that on um, on night two. Um, I did enjoy when Momo and Mayu actually just put it all out there i'm never not going to enjoy that dynamic it's fucking amazing just there was one moment where they were just going at each other and um momo hit this knee strike may you sort of hit this desperation super kick and they both went down it was just it was flawless and i know i'm slightly biased because may was amazing but it was i'm such a fan of momo i think she's just she's just absolutely amazing every match that i watch with momo i'm more and more interested in her character interested in her because she is fucking fantastic and this little exchange with mayu which would then be sort of exacerbated on night two really does get me excited for a possible matchup singles matchup for a belt between the two 
Yeah. Um, but the dynamic's always going to be good. It's basically two aces going at it, so it's, yeah, I'm definitely into it. Um, I do, it, does, it can't be over Dumbo. Like, you can't sort of do what you did with... I'm trying to think of an example of a match that got completely overdone. You, <laughs> Sonata and Okada last year got completely overdone. You can't do that. No, I agree. I agree. Um, as for as for the end of this match, I thought the closing stretch was really inventive. Mayu going for the two step dragon suplex. Uh, Azumi tries to roll through, but Mayu catches her and then sort of transitions from the two step dragon suplex into a dragon sleeper to get the submission victory at thirteen twenty three. I thought that was a really, really clever little bit of just just a subtle change. I thought it was really good. Yeah, it was really good. Um, I gave the match seven. Um, mm-hmm. I thought there was enough there. I, I, Rhea wasn't an issue for me in the same way she was an issue for you. Um, I thought she played the part well. She wasn't in the ring that much, to be perfectly honest, in this first tag match that she was in. So... Yeah, I mean, you've got Mayu, Azumi, and Momo in the ring. I didn't think there was. I didn't think it was a bad match. So I thought it was really good, very enjoyable. No, it was a really solid match. Just I have issues with Rio, and that's it. I have issues with this next match. So the main event of night one, <laughs> this match crawled, was your six man tag or six woman tag, should I say? But with the Are We the Tide team, Natsu Katora, Natsu Samia, and Saki Kashima defeating Donna Del Mondo, Julia. Himika and Micah in 2035. Chris, Jesus Christ, this was a troll. This crawled. This crawled. That's such a stuff. I can only. I, I took notes, and there's only one thing of note in this match, and that's Himika um, countering Natsu's um, Bronco Buster into a powerbomb. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, partly because of a look on. And that's whose face. That's right. It's like, <laughs> what? No, this isn't what's going to happen. No. <laughs> I did enjoy Himika getting both Saki and Natsu up for like a burning hammer torture rack in a position. That was pretty cool. Um, yeah. But... I do really want her versus Jamie as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, thing is, I'm, I am worried for when that singles match happens because like she's great in these tag matches, but... I d- I'm, I'm worried that like these tag matches are all she can do, and then like when she gets into a singles match, she's exposed. And sort of like in the moment of bliss right now, where I don't know. Yeah, well, we spoke about it towards the start of this podcast about how it can be hard to develop a character in these six women. I think Himika's sort of the anomaly here. I think she has developed that character. She's a big person who will crush anyone smaller than her. I think that's all she needs to be. I think if she has, you know, seven, eight, nine minute matches, you know, against people like Jamie, against people like Saya either. Um, Tam, yeah, absolutely. I think she's going to have no, really good matches. Say again, sorry. Utami. Oh, Utami. Oh, God, yeah, absolutely. But Tam as well. Um, you know, <laughs> I think they're going to be excellent matches because she's got a very basic move set, but she does it well. Um, yeah, she's only been going like a year as well, hasn't she? She's not been going long at all, which means she can go for that um, SWA Championship and the Future of Stardom Championship as well. So she's got two things that she can go for. I don't think she's an upper mid-carder yet, but... Yeah, in these six woman tags, I think at the moment she's found a niche for the moment. Um, I'm enjoying what Mikey does. Like, she, again, she's another one where she doesn't do a lot, but what she does is really clean. Yeah, absolutely. Big fan of Mikey. Big fan of Mikey. Um, she... <laughs> Not a big fan of many, anyone in the red though, are you? <laughs> okay, I might, I might as well get this off my chest now. I, just, I don't. They, are we the tie? Have always been the threat of stardom. They've always been the people that basically fuck shit up. And I just I don't feel that at the moment. I don't see Natsu Samir and Saki Kashima as a threat. Sure, that Saki's good in the ring. You know, there's there's nothing wrong with her in ring work. But I just I don't tour her to a certain extent I see as a threat, even though I'm sick, tired and fed up of seeing the chain shot, the ref bump, and you know cut, dry, repeat. That seems to be all we get at the moment from a Weed of Tide because they just, that seems to be a, they just can't seem to book it at the moment and it it led to, a, in my opinion, a very, very lackluster main event at Corican with her and Tam. Um, 
This match dragged, and I'll be perfectly honest, it was nothing to do with Donna Del Mondo because I thought they worked really well as a unit. They were portrayed really well as a unit. The only issue was um, with them that I have is that I'm not a massive fan of their sort of their tag signature move where Himika and Micah lift the person up and drop them into a Julia kick. Not a fan of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a very small thing, but it, they seem to wait for ages and ages and ages to sort of get into position and then for Julia to kick. Um, I just, I, I don't care about them. I'm not bothered about them. And th- to not elicit a reaction at all, to find them boring is not what you want from a heel. You want them to be those dicks that you're like, either they fuck shit up to the point where you're like, oh my God, holy shit, I can't believe they've just done that. Okay, or you you need to book them in a better way because at the moment I just don't give a shit about them. They're dull as fuck. Every Oida time match on these three cards have been the exact same match and have been dull and have gone too long. Even 12 minutes, which was the main event at Corican, felt like about 25. I'm just I'm not interested, I'd- Chris. I disagree on the Cork and Men event, but we'll get to that. I think um, the issue is um, Oedetai got fucked at the beginning of the year, but lost Kagetsu, they lost Hazuki, so they lost their first and second in command. And so they're like, okay, we'll draft him the Gaijin, that's an easy way to get hit, hit um, heat, you know, like the Bullet Club allegory. But then now we've lost access to all the Gaijin, so now it's just this nucle- nucleus free and like Saki was basically meant to turn here or have a feud with Mayu and then like be a tag wrestler to make up the numbers Natsu is always going to be someone there to make up the numbers and without Sash and Moth she's sort of directionless so like in terms of Oweda type this is probably the best you can do with them because you do need to build them if you don't have access to Jamie and B and Sash and Moth I do agree but, but I just I don't there isn't a character there. They don't seem to be cohesive. We talked, um, when was it? It was, oh, it was before last episode where they came to the ring and they saw they felt like a unit. They felt legitimate because you know they had the matching stuff. And but since then, their in ring is is nothing. Um, Saki still looks too nice to be a heel. Um, Natsu is a sex pest. You know, that's never going to be a badass heel. For goodness sake, she hits people with a fucking dominatrix whip. Okay, that's great. That's great in the undercard tag, but I don't buy her as a legitimate heel. I still don't understand what the fuck that bucket is. Am I missing something with that bucket? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> I just... Is it a... I think it's a spit bucket. I thought you were going to say it's a sex bucket. I was like, what is a sex bucket? Well, fluids. Oh, no. um, <laughs> that's that's fucking grim, mate. That's horrendous. Okay, there's no explanation for the bucket that's not grim. I just I don't I don't buy it. And the the result the result baffled me. And that's that's not because Saki okay, but... won. And I'll I'll let me let me just quickly tell you why it baffled me and then we can talk about it. I completely understand that Oida Tai needed to win this match. I completely understand that. That makes perfect sense. I completely understand that you are trying to build Saki. 100% give Saki the victory. I don't mind that at all. But you have got Julia, who is unbeaten since her jump from Ice Ribbon to Stardom, to the point where they've made a huge deal of the fact that she's gone so long without being beaten. You've got the person who won the Cinderella who, you know, even though it hadn't been announced at this point, we knew she would be going for the white belt. Why would you then have Julia pinned in this match in a throwaway six-man tag? Surely have them pin Micah. Surely. She is the rookie of that group. You did not need... And I understand that unbeaten streaks are extremely difficult to book. And, you know, if it goes on too long... I mean, look at, you know, for a WWE reference, look at Charlotte, whose unbeaten streak was only on pay-per-view. Then it was only on pay-per-view in singles matches. Then it was only, you know... I understand that they can get quite messy. I'm not saying keep Julia unbeaten. I'm just saying if you are going to take that from someone you are trying to build as one of the top stars in the company, this is not the way you take the unbeaten streak offer. At least don't have it be a roll-up. Well, 
okay, it's a roll-up. That's absolutely fine. Julia went for the glorious driver. Saki catches her with the Kishikasai. And at 20 minutes 35, it's a roll-up. It's a fluke victory. I Fine. Okay. I just I don't understand why it had to be in an undercard tag. Have a lose in a high-profile singles match or even in a high-profile tag match. This made no sense to me. I understand. And again, I'll repeat. I know that Oida Tai needed to win to set up challenging for the artist of stardom championships. That makes perfect sense. Why Julia? Okay, and your unbeaten leader, who is basically the person you're basing your entire company around at the moment, why her and why not the rookie in that team? Makes no sense. It doesn't. Although... Um, I have more bad news is that we have to see this fucking match again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, we do. Um, at least there's at least there is something to fight for. At least it's for a title. Um, and Siri will be in there, and she's good. Yeah, exactly. Siri is fantastic. I can't believe how much of a 180 I've done on Siri. And to be fair, <laughs> and to be fair, Julia as well, because I don't have an issue with Julia. I think she's improved massively. I have no issue with her at all now. I don't at all, Chris. We'll get to that. Um... <laughs> right, so night two? Yeah, I was just going to say, is there anything else you want to add about night one? Um, no, I'm, I'm still in that bliss phase of, oh, Stardom's back. Yay, and they haven't done anything overly bad like, it's not like new japan who started doing like half an hour trudging ethics straight away like stardom hasn't sort of fallen into their worst aspects and stardom does have bad aspects but like it's not sort of fallen into them yet yeah so they haven't turned starlight kid heel and had her beat <laughs> mayu for the championship so it's got one up on uh, new japan at the moment so, night two at Shinkiba was the following day on the 12th of July. Again, the card wasn't known beforehand, so we had some unit promos. Just two things to note from these. Um, Julia refuses to acknowledge the fact that she lost the previous day to Saki, um, and Himika and Mike are just constantly going, but you did lose, but, but you did lose. And then Julia screaming, I did not lose, and storming off. Thought that was great. I think it would be great if they proper delve all into this storyline and have Julia just descend into madness because of this one defeat <laughs> to Saki Kashima. And then, and then she fucking beheads Saki. In <laughs> yeah, just in the five star, just absolutely destroys Saki. It'd be great. It'd be absolutely great. I just, I really enjoyed Himika here because she just had that look of, what are you on about? You lost. What are you on about? You lost. And then she did it at the end of the <laughs> night as well. To be honest, I'm just happy that Julia finally managed to cut a decent promo and like, hardly bothered with the words love 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 or julia sometimes not in that order but also <laughs> always in that order um there was lots and lots of um sort of standard promos but the one that stood out to me was natsu samir thinking it's funny that rena hina and ida all rhyme and that she wants a six woman tag match against all of them until Tora says that's not how it works they're not in the same faction uh which again i thought was really really funny <laughs> it really tickled well, me some... natsu just doesn't care no, she doesn't. Um, we open with the first match then, which was a singles match between Hina and Rina. Um, Chris, standard match. Hina gets revenge for a loss at Stardom is again by pinning Rina in 4 minutes and 43 seconds with the sit-out Gato clutch. I've got nothing else to say about this match, have you? Yeah, one day these two are going to have to have an actual feud and this is going to be this magic. I must admit... I'm I'm a fan of both of them, but Rena at the moment has got she's got something. She's got a little bit of star quality that Hina hasn't quite got. Does that make sense? You see, she walks into the ring and you see you see the potential of Rena. She's got more of a move set, and I know that they wrestled almost move for move the exact same match at the Corican show, but I still think that Rena has got big, big things in her future. I see her as a potential like champion already. She's fourteen or whatever. Whereas I thirteen, 13 exactly. For fuck's sake, she's thirty. I, but I don't see that yet with Hina. I'm not saying it's not there. I see it more with Rena than Hina. I try not to judge for children. Oh, it isn't a judging thing by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just saying I can see it in Rena now. 
maybe I don't know. I I have a problem with this ma- these matches being filmed. I do think we should be dark. Do you think that is something to do with the amount of people they've actually got and they're trying to fill out a card? No, because they put on these matches anyway. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Some of them sometimes they're dark. They're not always filmed. Yeah, but like I think for the most part, they should, because quite frankly, like I'm not being funny. We had three shows in what five days. I don't think anyone's going to be mad that we didn't get a sub five minutes match between two children. No, fair enough. Um, we move on then. I gave that four stars, Chris, just because you know there was nothing offensive about it. It was just a sub five minute match. Yeah. Um, Jungle Kiona versus Saya Ida in Jungle Kiona's comeback singles match. Chris, what did you think? Uh, I, I, with Jungle, I could definitely see her finding her feet the more she wrestled. Like, you could sort of see it in her um, face that she was a tad overwhelmed, which kind of makes sense. But, like, as she got into, like, the groove of the match, she sort of just got back to the old Jungle. Yeah, absolutely. There was certainly a small bit of trepidation going into the match, but I think when you're wrestling... Saite does no 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 frills. She is a striker with some drop kicks. That's that's literally what it is, and it works for her. You know, we've both said on this podcast just how much we think she's great, and it worked here because Jungle just they had a strike exchange. It was great. Um, it's literally hoss people doing hoss things. Yes, <laughs> two dudes being guys. <laughs> two guys. No, wait, no. Completely the opposite. Completely the opposite of that. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, that was my, on my little match of the year thread I have going on, on the notes app on my phone. That's the review for both show versus Shingo uh, matches. Just dudes being guys. Yeah, just two dudes being guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, this match was fun. Again, I'm just happy to see Jungle. She's my favourite, so I'm happy to see her. Um, Sai Reader was a good choice because you're not going to have to go above and beyond in a Sai Reader match. Um, like if it all goes wrong, Sayuri can just chop you, and then you can knock her over and win. But like, I'm, I'm, after what happens in the next match, I am looking forward to Jungle Kiona's future. She's sort of been thrown into the deep end, but I do have faith in her if she feels she's ready. So, no, I agree. Um, Ten minutes and Jungle won with a diving top rope splash. Um, I gave it six stars. Um. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, but it was it was nothing special. It was it was literally just to reacquaint that Shinkiba audience with Jungle Kiona and what she was about. Yeah, exactly. However, we then come to the match of this entire three shows. We had a three way match between Momo Watanabe, Konami, and Mayo. Uh, sorry, Mayo, Mayu Iwatani. A how the fucking mayor. <laughs> mayor. How the fuck was this not the main event of the show? Baffles me. Completely and utterly baffles me. And secondly, this is probably my stardom match of the year. Because fucking hell, what a match. I wouldn't go that far. Um, I thought it was really good. It's probably the second best no stakes stardom match this year after the tag match in Osaka. But yeah, this was just we no one stopped. No, no one stopped at any point. It was. It started. It, it there was three very very different parts. There was a start where you had Konami and Momo teaming up on Mayu. Then you had it was almost like you had three very very different matches going on at the same time. You had Konami versus Momo, which was strikes. Then you got Konami versus Mayu, which was Konami working the leg and the shoulder. And then you got Mayu versus Momo, which was just pace and clinical precision. It was, it was such a great dynamic, and you didn't miss too much the fact that for a lot of the time there was two people in the ring and one was just sort of standing on the outside it didn't affect the match too much because then when it came to that sort of closing stretch and all three were in the ring jesus christ it was great and i did say this on twitter and i believe it said it in our discord discord as well this is the best that i've seen konami she's had great matches before but here being in the ring with Mayu and Momo, she was elevated to another level here. And it wasn't the fact that 
you know, she was carried. She held her own in this match. Yeah, um, I did like how at the start, um, May was messing with Konami and then Momo was like, what? No, and just started hitting May. <laughs> it was great. It was great. There was the, some of the strikes, and I say this on a regular basis about this promotion, some of the strikes were horrendous. There was a moment where I believe it's Momo is working Mayu's shoulder and then finishes it off with this kick. And the kick is like a fucking thunderclap. And Mayu sells it amazingly, but the oh my god, the sound is absolutely just just horrendous. Um, there's a wonderful double German suplex from Konami where they do this sort of. <laughs> it was almost like they're at a children's party, and the person at the front had to run to the back, and they did this exchange where they all wanted to do a German suplex, and then Konami is the one to d- double German both Momo and Mayu over her head. It was. Everything they did from that to Konami going into the triangle, Lancer and Momo running knee striking Konami off of Mayu. Just everything was so smooth. It was done at a great pace. And I was enthralled. I couldn't believe when the bell rang and it was a time limit draw. I genuinely couldn't believe that we'd had 15 minutes. I like how we got more desperate as we got closer to the time limit. Oh, yeah. The pace ramped up, didn't it? That's because, like, we look at another time limit draw we had this year in um, Itami versus Micah, and they just didn't get more desperate towards the time limit. They just kept wrestling like normal. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So, like, here it really worked. No one ended up looking bad. And, like, I kind of like how both Momo and Konami went after Mayu more because she's got the belt, pin her, you get a title shot. Made sense, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It was good storytelling. Um, there was one more spot that I just wanted to talk about, which was the one that was Gift, um, which was Mayu attempting a tombstone on Momo and Konami kicking the back of Mayu. So she completed the tombstone, but was then out cold as well. I thought that was a really, really cool spot. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Um, yeah, it's just unbelievably fluid. Like In terms of an example, I kind of go to the TNA... Um, 2005 and break, but one, it's not as good as that, but like, you know, I'm like that sort of thing where it just didn't let up for the whole match. Yeah, absolutely. And it's Konami for me, because again, I've, I've only been watching stardom since the start of this year, the end of last year. And she's always been sort of, you know, that upper mid carder, you know, the one that she <laughs> can't quite break into that main event. This was a great case for her to be broken into that sort of, you know, red belt, certainly white belt, but pushing for the red belt scene because here she didn't miss a step and she's in there with two fucking quick and bloody seamless wrestlers in Momo and Mayu. Um, After the match, um, Mayu says to both women that they've come on massively, they're stronger than they were before, but there's one person she wants to talk to first, wants to have a battle with first, and that person is Jungle Kiona, who literally must have sprinted to the ring because she was in before Mayu had finished, um, saying she'd waited for ages and ages and ages for this because she should have had a match in March, but it was cancelled, sorry, in February, but it was cancelled. She says, how about a match? On the 24th of July in Nagoya, which of course is Jungle's hometown, Mayu says that's great, and then we have a stare-off, and our main event for Nagoya is sorted. Before we get into that, Chris, uh, Viva La Jedi on the Discord um, says, is it the right or wrong time for Red Belt Jungle? There's arguments against... Um, both for and against. It could be a bit more rich story if you were having like a proper chase. But at the same time, um, are you really going to throw into the deep end this close to coming back um, to not win it? I don't know. Like, because also if she won it, Stan could be accused of doing what um, WWE did with Ray and Eddie. Oh yeah, the real, I hadn't even thought of that. Um... It. It, it could be. It completely depends on how they handle it, it's a, and we don't know how they're going to handle it yet. Well, that was why I wanted to talk about the Mayu match the previous night because obviously in her hometown, Jungle is going to be the face. So you know, mm-hmm. no one's going to be cheering for Mayu. So I wondered if that's why she wrestled just a little bit of that arrogant, cocky dickhead style on night one. 
Maybe. Um, but I see him more being like an earnest champion in that match than a um than a heel. Like think of how she was against Ihara. Yeah, okay. Um I mean the big question is is Jungle going to win? Because for me, I personally, I know it's Nagoya. I know it's Jungle's hometown. For me, it is too early for Jungle to have this shot, full stop. And the only reason I think that is is because I don't think she's going to win it. And if she does win it, it just seems, I don't know, it, does, it doesn't seem like the right time. Not, not for me, anyway. Um, I'd have left it. I'd definitely give her the red belt, you know, but I think there needs to be a chase um, you know, doing it in a hometown of Nagoya, fine, but you run the risk of if she doesn't win it, then there are problems. Yeah, well, um, she's had to have matches in Nagoya before. But again, do you want her to lose? No, no, I never want Jungle. <laughs> that's that's true. That is true. Do you do you see Jungle winning on the twenty fourth? I I genuinely don't know. It's the first red belt defense in a while. And, like, a new champion would definitely help generate headlines. It's a good time to test jungle because you don't need to worry about drawing power. But then again, Stardom's never really worried about that. Like, they put it on B Priestley on what felt like a win. So, I generally don't... Like, last thing about Stardom, it's not like... Um, it's not like New Japan where, like... Or All Japan where, like, the top belt is so exclusive among, like, three or four wrestlers until Evil comes along. Um, like genuinely anyone can win it like no one saw B being Kagetsu last year but that happened my only reservation is that a couple of days ago Stardom announced that they'll be doing two shows August 22nd and August 23rd um, the Stardom Yokohama Cinderella 2020 at the brand new Yokohama Budokan now the official um, capacity of this venue is 3,000, which is an enormous... Obviously, they're not going to draw that because of the current, you know, the current restrictions. But we don't know what it's going to be like in August. You know, there could be more people allowed into that building. My question to you is, you are drawing a brand new building, a big brand new building. Horrible as it sounds, is Jungle Kiona the person you want at the top of that card? I don't know. Stardom always strikes me as somewhere that draws based on name value right now, so they could afford to take that chance. It's weird. I, I don't know. I genuinely do not know. Like It's one of those things where you'd have to wait and see how it goes. It's a difficult one, isn't it? I think if this big show wasn't round the corner, and again, it's August 22nd, August 23rd, over a month away, lots could have changed by then. And don't forget, with it being 3,000 people, they can still social distance, but have a significantly bigger attendance than, say, Corican, where they've only drawn 256 people. Well, if they're doing what we did in, like, Osaka Jaha, where they have a third capacity, that's about a Corican. Exactly, it's a 1,000 people. So um, I think it's literally just a backdoor way to have a Corican show. It's a, it's a lot of people for stardom. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's about their max attendance. So, and that's, you know, assuming that you know, things aren't somewhere back to, you know, close to back to being normal. I don't know. I think it could be a little bit too early for Jungle with the red belt. That's not because Mayu holds it. Um, I do think that Mayu should have a couple more defences and then maybe Jungle pin her at the five-star Grand Prix and then beat her that way. Again, we'll we'll wait and see. Um, We'll wait and see. So... We then move on from what was my match of the three. Now, I gave it nine, by the way, Chris. What did you give it? I, I gave it an eight. Well, you're wrong. I'm not, I'm not wrong. <laughs> no, fine. High, high um, eight, yeah. It's got, it's got 8.11 on um, cage match. So, like, my opinion matches up with common consensus. I'll have you know. <laughs> <laughs> you sheep. You absolute sheep. Um, We then cut from that wonderful exhibition of wrestling to what was <laughs> quite possibly the worst match of the entire three nights with the Oida. Okay, it, it wasn't because this had a this had a decent finish. No, mate. I disagree completely. 
Completely. Um, okay. Natsukatori and Utami have good chemistry. And you know what? I'm down for that. That's absolutely fine. But this match was dull as fuck. I'm not saying it was exciting, but I, f- I preferred it to the match from the night before. I didn't. I gave it three. It went 14 minutes and three <laughs> seconds, Chris. And aside from Tori using the chain and hitting the ascension, I genuinely cannot tell you anything about this match. Saki did a pretty cool springboard bulldog. That's it. It was a pretty cool springboard, <laughs> springboard bulldog. She's good at moves. She's good at attack setting. It's just, there was, there's there's nothing. The went fast. There was nothing. It, it, didn't, it didn't connect with me. It dragged. And that's, as I said before, I'm not ragging on Oedotai. I understand that they've lost Kagetsu and Azuki, who are, you know, two, <coughs> pardon me, big things to lose. But this was so boring and so by the numbers. And when you consider that the entire finish from this match was cut and taken into the main event of Corican, where, you know, we had the chain shot, then the ascension. Yes, I know Tam kicked out, but it's the exact same thing. And it just seems to be, right, we're heels. That means that we just hit people with chains and that's it. I just, I, I don't the care. It's loud as well. Yeah, it is. How is the ref not hearing this? <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm bored of a weed a tie and... That's not good when they're supposed to be your heels. You need to feel some kind of hatred towards them, and I don't. I just find them dull, boring, and irritants, but not in the good way. I still stand by the Tara makes a good heel right now. Okay, she's... Uh, <laughs> compared to... I agree with you, with, and I agree with you that Natsu is too comedy to be taken seriously, but like I think... Tora is a decent leader. It's just that she doesn't have a good faction around her right now. The problem is with Tora is that we've had three matches, and I know two of them were six-woman tags, but we had what was effectively the same match three times, and that's where I take issue. I don't have an issue with the fact that she is, you know, the badass leader of a weeder tag because she's she's played that relatively well. You know, she's shoving referees and telling people she can't be asked to do promos and stuff like that, just basically being a bit of a dick, which is fine. That's not what I have issue with. It's the fact that we seem to be having the exact same match repeated, and that's not good. That's dull and boring and, let's face it, shit. And there's not a chance, Chris. This was a match that included Yutami and Azumi, and I was bored there's not a chance this should have gone 14 minutes. Not a chance. No, 14 minutes. I think it was also in a bit of a death spot anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was a little bit. Because um, you've got, obviously, the three-way before it, and then I I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this main event. Um, yeah, it was main event. But yeah, I, I couldn't give it above three, Chris. I, I gave it a six. I, I, had, I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was fun. I thought it was a fine enough tag match. I did prefer it to the tag match the night before. I wasn't actively bored throughout this match. And I had enough like little cool bits to like be about the higher end of average for me. We'll agree to disagree on that one, I feel. Um, main event time then. And we had another six-woman tag with Donna Del Mondo taking on Rio, Tam Nakano, and Starlight Kid. This was absolutely fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed this match, Chris. This was enjoyable. Um, one of my favourite parts is when Starlight Kid kept ducking under Himika. So Himika just waited half a second and stepped on Starlight. Oh, it was brilliant. Where she was doing the rolls. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Absolutely br- just brilliant. And then you've got Julia just before wanting to have this, like, her and Tam doing the stare off. And you're like, oh, they're going to start mm-hmm. with these two. And then Himika just literally strong arms Julia out of the ring. And you can see Julia's face like, the fuck are you doing? No, no. <laughs> and then Himika's just like, come on, out of the ring, you crazy psycho. Just get out of the ring. And then the match, I just really enjoyed it. And that's what I mean. There is there is character being built with Himika, which is something mm-hmm. that I don't feel with, like, a weed tie. She's sort of phallet esque Yeah, almost. But it... She's a little bit more like, you know, I don't know, likable than, than Battle of Farley. 
<laughs> but you know, how, like how Fale was sort of just pushed like Tamatonga out the way, and like, no, I, I'm the leader here. <laughs> um, Are you really fight with me? I'm <laughs> that is her entire thing. That is her entire thing. I'm going to use my body weight to crush people was the promo on the first night. Um, I really, really enjoyed the chain wrestling between Rio and Himika, which I am just going to say, when you consider the size disparity between the two, I thought that was even more impressive. When you think of what Rio used to work with in AEW, like people like Nala Rose, who are much, much bigger than it. And like Nala Rose is a bit bigger than Himika as well. So. Yeah, no, I, no, fair enough. I suppose that has helped. Um, but I, I really enjoyed it. And again, I thought Riho was great here. The dropkick tornado DDT combo on Himika and Micah was fantastic. I thought that was really good. Yeah, that's been that's Rio works well in tag matches like this because everyone on the other team's bigger than her. She's about the same size as that, so she can basically just bounce off people. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The ensuing matchup between Tam and Julia was everything I wanted it to be and more. It was stiff, and I loved it. And there was a moment where they just literally beaten the shit out of each other to the point where they were both double. They were both down, and you'd got mm. Starlight going for the tag on one side, and I think it was Himmiker on the other side, leaning over the tag. And both women refused to tag out so that they could beat each other up just a little bit more. And I love that, because it really does get over how much these two hate each other at the moment. Yeah, like, they just won't stop. No. And it... it, it I mean, and I meant to ask you this before... Obviously, we saw on Twitter that there was a fight during a bikini shoot, which can only happen in stardom. I'm not, I'm not I, a fan, Chris. <laughs> neither, neither am I. Like, I kind of enjoy the oh, we can't even get along for like, like optional purposes. But like, you could have done that about the fucking '90s cat fight, you know what I mean? And like, I don't know. I think lockdown has made it much harder for like people like us who actually watch stardom for the wrestling to argue that point because stardom fans have gotten fucking thirsty in lockdown and it's not fun <laughs> um not all star I, I should say it's like a very vocal 15 percent. yeah thankfully there are lovely people on our discord and our twitter so thank you to those people. yeah like on yeah the, the our discord is actually lovely apart from the fact that there's one guy who doesn't like my opinions on evil but <laughs> I, actually, it's because your opinions on evil are I, wrong yeah my opinions are just my opinions on New Japan keep getting me in trouble. Someone on the New Japan fan page literally like lightly threatened me the other day because um, someone was like, "Oh, the Rainmaker isn't re- realistic, so I don't like it." I'm like, "Well, it's wrestling; nothing's realistic. Like, you watch any legitimate fighting, it's not realistic." But that's not the point. And then someone's like, someone got got annoyed at me, and then like after a bit of an exchange, he was like. You better watch Karma will come back around to you and you never know who's not gonna like what you say. I'm like, mate, we're arguing about fake fighting. <laughs> <laughs> Are you really fascinating? But yeah, um, in terms of the style and thing, like just everyone like a lot like the most weird people make it hard for, hard for that and like stuff like that sort of leans into that and I sort of get like especially in Japan, like the idol with idol culture, that's sort of their main fan base. But like for international fans, it's just I'm I'm not into it, and neither are you. And I don't think anyone on Discord is. It's like mainly just people in like stardom groups, who like well, like the type of people who just post a picture of from Tam's Instagram and go and with the caption "damn" and that's it. Yeah. Now Julie was on a TV show and Tam attacked her on that. That I thought was great. I'm into that. I, I like that. Just I'm not into the nineties cat fights yet. No. No, no, I agree with you. Like, on, honestly, if some... Like, a good rule of thumb is if I can play a clip of Joy Stars from ECW shouting catfight over um, the angle, it's probably not a good angle. <laughs> um, back to this match then. Um, just before the finish, we got a Starlight Kid rotating frog splash, which looked class. I can't say enough good things about Starlight Kid at the moment. Um before Julia gets the win at 17 minutes and 46 seconds with the glorious driver. Um, just before we get onto the post-match bit, which is the most important thing I think that happened the entire night, um, I gave it eight, Chris. Um, I give it a high seven. Yeah, so it, it, it roughly works out. So 
Julia starts her promo by mocking Tam's cooking videos on Twitter, which I thought was fucking hilarious. Um, no, I like how she's um, promo of your irritable. <laughs> <laughs> um, then says she wants the white belt because of the Cinderella tournament, which, let's face it, she does have a point because everything that's set up in this angle sort of negates the fact that she won the tournament. Yeah. Um, remember how I said that's just what they should have done? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. Though I will take a little uh, a little mini victory lap because basically everything I said was exactly what has happened. Um, <laughs> is it even the same people? I think it is even the same people. Yeah. Um, so Tam gets in Julia's face, eats a slap. They sort of have a fight and they agree to a match, uh, Tam, because obviously she's Arissa's best friend, and she said that she'd never let the belt get into Julia's hands. Um, but before they can make it official, Tora comes down and is very, very annoyed because she was next in line. Uh, she didn't get a match in February, she didn't get a match in March, therefore she wants her match now. So Julia says that they should have a three-way match. Um, and that is when Konami appears, uh, wearing the biggest trainers I think I've ever seen in my entire life, and says... <laughs> They were big. They were massive. Um, and then comes in and says, wouldn't it be better if I was included? Let's make it a tournament. The crowd loved that. My question to you, Chris, is what fucking claim does yeah, Konami, Konami have? Konami has no legitimate <laughs> claim. It's like, you know what it's like? Do you remember when um, Dr. Bushi challenged Kenny? And then Cody just walked into the ring and went, we're friends now, right? Yes. I should be added to That's me. exactly what it is. It was- and, like, I'm trying to think if there's anyone on the roster who actually has a legitimate claim. Um, has anyone pinned a recent, recently? Um, no, not well, not recently, obviously. <laughs> not that I can remember. I know. Um, so Ida won a battle royal back at No People Gate. She has more of the fucking... <laughs> yeah. She has more of the shit. Um, yeah, it was just very strange that of all people, it was Konami. Um but yeah, so a championship tournament was going to take place over the next two Corican shows with the two semi-finals main eventing the first night at Corican, the Stardom Explode and Summer Show on the 17th, and then the final taking place on the 26th. Um, the two uh, semi-finals will be Tam Nakano versus Natsukatora and Julia versus Konami. Um, so, Chris, before... Because I read did a rematch. I really wanted a rematch of that um, five down match, but we both hated. <laughs> um, before we move on to that um, aforementioned Corican ma- uh, Corican show, is there anything you want to mention regarding the second Shinkiba show? It, it was definitely an improvement over the first one. A um, couple of really, really good matches. Um, uh, great to see Jungle back. It set up, I think, a bit more. And yeah, it's just like both of these are really easy watches. Just skip your weather time matches. Quite literally, yeah. Um, so we then go to the Exploding Summer Show, which was obviously at Corrigan Hall, 17th of July, in front of 264 people, which you could really tell. Whereas at Chinkiba, which is, you know, a smaller venue anyway, you could really, really see just how few people were in Corrigan because it's what, a quarter full? Probably less than that. So yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's cork and hold like. Yeah. So yeah, it was. Uh, there was not many people there, but to be fair, they were still very, very vocal in certain parts. So that was really good. Um, we opened with another singles match between Rena and Hina. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Rena won with the Hydrangea at four minutes and twenty nine seconds. As I said before, it was pretty much the exact same match we had before, so I gave it the exact same score as before. Four stars. I mean, like it's twenty seconds less, so maybe. Three. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not arguing the sake of a star for twenty seconds of wrestling. Um, we then come to our second match, which was a tag match between Utami Hayashishita and Riho taking on the Oida Tai team of Natsu and Saki. We started with a legitimately funny exchange between Utami and Riho as Utami tries to get Riho to join Queen's Quest. Uh, Riho says that Natsu is always so nice to her, but she's scared. So Utami says, leave it to her, to which Riho replies, well, you sound reliable. 
Um, and they make jokes about Rio being homeless. And it was nice because I don't think we get enough... We don't see enough of that side, especially of Utami, um, who's basically the big silent bruiser of Queen's Quest. We don't really see this side of it. I thought they had really, really good chemistry and that sort of... It sort of leaked into the match because I thought they had quite good chemistry in that match as well. Um, Natsu and Saki didn't say anything. Um, Natsu turned to Saki and said, have you got anything? And Saki says, no, I'm putting on my costume. And they leave. What do you think of this match? <laughs> what do you think of this match, Chris? It was sure, it was fun. I have no complaints, but nothing to say about it more than what you've said. Like, this is the perfect spot on the card for Natsu. Um, Saki maybe has like a bit more potential, but like, every chance that she ever has a title match, I'd want to skip it. So, yeah, this is just fine. Like, a lot of Rio's issues weren't overly present because you don't need to be aggressive against Saki and Natsu. So, that's the thing. Um, Utami hit the torture rack bomb at 8.59 on Natsu for the victory. I gave it five stars. Um, I think this sort of epitomized the problem for um, Oida Sai for me. And I think this is just because they are missing B and Jamie. Um, you've got Natsukatora, who's sort of up around that upper mid card. And then you have got two far lower down. You've got Natsu, who effectively is a show opener. And you've got Saki, who's, you know sort of middly mid card sort of a tag division artist of stardom sort of person i don't really see her as anything more she can, than that she can be brought in for a title match if there's no one she'll deliver yeah absolutely but i don't think she's she's not the name she's not your, she's not your best option oh, she likes she, literally if your champions ran for everyone else um you go for her as a fellow defense because the only reason she went against mayor is because you need to conclude that feud. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um but and like even Mayo didn't take it every time Saki would like challenge her, she'd be like, I don't have time for you right now. <laughs> um so we then move on from that. Obviously I'll just read out the results for the other two matches because as of five to four on the twentieth of July, which is what when we're recording this, they aren't on Stardom World. So match three was a tag team match between the Donna Del Mondo team of Himika and Siori, defeating Tokyo Cyber Squad team of Death Yamasan and Jungle Kiona at nine minutes and six seconds. And then your fourth match was another tag team match with the Stars team of Mei Wiwatani and Starlight Kid, defeating the Queen's Quest team of Azumi and Momo Watanabe in 13 minutes and 44 seconds. Right, so this brings us to match five, Chris. And I want to quickly read out the rules. So, we are obviously talking about our future of stardom title three-way match. Now, what I thought we were going to get was your normal three-way, which is what we had the previous ma the previous show with Momo, Mayu, and Konami. But no, 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 no. No, no. Instead, we <laughs> hugely overcomplicated things. Uh, so the rules, as, <laughs> as we're on Stardom World, uh, this is what was given to us. This is a Tomo Sen battle. Two players compete in a singles match. The third wrestler waits outside the ring. The winner then faces the third wrestler. You must win two consecutive matches to be declared the overall winner. Now, I don't know about you, Chris, just before I read through what actually happened in this match, I don't know about you, that makes things unnecessarily complicated. It's not overly complicated, basically just win twice in a row and you're in, but... Yeah, I don't know when Ventruso started booking Stardom. But... <laughs> Just very, very unnecessary. Like, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's a very Ventruso move like to add like an unnecessary gimmick on, on top of normal. Like, you know how you like, put gimmick on top of like, a battle royal? Like, you had to, like, it's a reverse battle royal, so everyone needs to go in, and then it's a normal battle royal, but the last two people have to pin each other, and like, it's unnecessary, isn't it? Just literally have a three-way. Or if you're going to do something like, like I this... Do, I do like the gimmick in one respect because, like... I, I like the gimmick in one respect because it's a... Um, it gives everyone a chance to beat each other. So, like, no one comes out looking weak, I guess. Everyone's been pinned. Everyone's pinned each other. But, yeah. Yeah. I, no, I, I get that. It's just... Well, it just... It was very, very strange 
when uh, when it was announced. So these are the uh, the order of what happened then. So um, Saya Kamatani defeated Saida at five minutes and three seconds. Micah then beat Saya Kamatani in nine minutes and twelve. Saya Ida then beat Micah at ten forty eight. Saya Kamatani then beat Saya Ida again at 11 minutes 52. Micah then defeated Saya Kamatani at 14.37 and then beat Saya Ida at 17.38 to become the new future of stardom champion. So you said everyone got a chance to beat everyone. That's true, apart from the fact that Saya Ida couldn't beat Saya Kamatani. Um, two things then, Chris. First, I gave it six stars. And then the second thing, Viva La JD on Discord has said, basically, did the right person win? It's To that answer, I say it's a future of Stardom Championship, who cares? But um, for a more complex answer, kind of, you're trying to build up um, Donovan Del Mondo right now. And to do that, you do need to throw gold their way that isn't tag gold. So this is a decent way to do it. Mike is a decent rookie. Like, honestly, of these two, I'd be picking between her and Saya either. Um, Because Saya, I'm bad at tall Saya. Um, (laughs) She has, um, she sort of has tag team gold in her future. So, like, honestly, the only people who really need it are either Micah or Saya either. I don't think Saya either loses much because... At the end of the day, Mike is all about tween a heel, so like Syreda can face her on a um, Shinkiba show or something and win it because it's the future of Stardom Championship. Who actually cares? Yeah, I agree with you. Um, it would have been nice to see Syreda win it um, because just of how much she's improved. But that's just because we love her. Yeah, honestly, I feel she's improved that's, hugely. That's just because she's our favourite. Um, yeah, it's like. Um, it's like how I would root for Tai Chi in any match he's in, no matter how illogical it is to root for him. <laughs> Although he almost won the cup. He, he did almost win the cup. He did. Fucking Sonata. Um, anyway. Anyway. Let's move on then um, to our semi-main, which was the first semi-final of the Wonder of Stardom Championship Tournament with Julia defeating Konami in 19 minutes and 4 seconds. Chris, opinion on this match? I enjoyed it. Honestly, I think Konami and Julia bring to each other stuff the other one doesn't have, which I think helps. Because, like, Julia isn't amazing at structure, like, at structuring her matches to have, like, a, a logical build. And Konami's not great at um, bomb exchanges. Like, her offense doesn't always pop. So I think, uh, whereas Julia's, as much as I have issues with her, her, her offense tends to pop. So, like, they sort of brought to each other what each other needed, which sort of led to a solid, well-paced match. I really enjoyed it, especially the technical start. I, like, the way some, like, they got into holds felt fairly legit, which is rare and start and normally it's just straight to bombs. Um, but when it got going with bombs, it was really enjoyable. Um, it's, don't get me wrong, it's not going to blow your socks off, but I do think it's probably the second best match of this run, other than um, the three-way from... And Kiba show. Yeah, and I I just think these two complement each other's styles fairly well. I agree with you. I think they've got good chemistry. And I certainly agree with you about the extended mat wrestling sequence. Just before the match, uh, Julia put over Konami as the biggest threat in the tournament um during her pre-match promo, which I thought was good, certainly added a little bit of um sort of legitimacy to Konami. Um in Julia's head, she's like, well, I've beaten Natsuko, and um, I hate Tam, so why would I put her? <laughs> um, I don't know how much time had passed, but Julia's hair had grown about 15 inches, so... Um, pre- hey. I know, I'm joking. Um yeah, so obviously we had the extended mat wrestling sequence, which was which was great. It was a completely different side to, especially Julia, um, which I hadn't seen. Um, and then towards the end of the match, the pace really, really picked up. And I'd say about four minutes from the end, we had just an absolutely fantastic sequence between the two of them. Um, had that pace or had that been the story for the match... I'd have been inclined to give it a higher grade than I did. My problem with it was this match went 19 minutes. Pardon me, a shade over. 
And for me, there was bits, especially between that extended mat wrestling sequence and just after they got back into the ring from the outside, where it just meandered. It didn't really have a direction. It sort of, it lost a little bit of oomph. It sort of just was there and they seemed to be doing things for the sake of doing them. It picked up again, like I said, for that closing sequence. That closing sequence was absolutely great um, with Konami um, locking in the Triangle Lancer as uh, Julia kicked out of an air raid crash, which was great. Um, Konami kicking out of the Glorious Driver and a Michinoku Driver, so she was sort of built very, very strongly. And the fact that Julia had to hit a Glorious Driver, hold on, and then hit a second one to pin Konami, I thought that was a really, really nice touch, and it looked good as well. But, I don't know, it just it seemed to meander. I don't think it needed to be nearly 20 minutes anyway. The match itself, neither neither of these wrestlers need to be in 20-minute matches. If this match had have gone 15, 14 even, I think this could have been a really, really highly graded match. But as it stands, I felt like there was a little bit too much dead space. And I gave it a 7. It was still a good match, but it was stopped from being great just by that just meandering, basically, that lack of direction. I think I must kind of admit, because honestly, one thing I did enjoy is one of the best transitions into Stealth Viper we've ever seen. Like, sometimes Stealth Viper can be a bit um, contrived just because of how much bigger Julia is compared to most of the Stardom roster. But, like, I felt Konami set herself up for Stealth Viper perfectly. It was fairly seamless. Um, Konami ended up looking like a million bucks coming out of this and like I was never bored throughout this match although I do agree like 90 minutes is a bit long it's very rare that a match was too long in the criticism we have of Stardom but like that's the case here but like so I enjoyed it I can't I'm coming on to Julie a bit more in terms of an in-ring thing she's sort of like a diesel type like she doesn't do much but she hits you hard I, I, I'm into this match I gave it an A Okay, I mean, I, I gave it a seven, so we're, we're roughly the same. It's not like we're miles and miles and miles apart in terms of that. I just, I don't know. There was, there was just something that stopped it from being that. Um, before we move on then to the main event, Philip Shaw on Facebook asks, "Where does Konami go from here?" So, just a little bit of background. Um, Philip asked that before it was announced that the Goddesses of Stardom tag titles were vacated. So, the match on the twenty sixth at Corican for the vacant championships is going to be Jungle Kiona and Konami uh, versus Utami and Saya. Now, this is obviously after Jungle's um, attempt at getting the red belt from Mayu on the 24th in Nagoya. Um, so, irrelevant of whether she's red belt or not, she's going to be in this match. I think, personally, I think the belts will go to Utami and Saya. Um... The only thing is then, where does Konami go from there? It sort of puts her in a little bit of purgatory, I suppose. She could be a challenger for the red belt, you know, one of those filler defences against whoever. Um, obviously, that's sort of scuppered a little bit if they do pull the trigger on tr trigger on jungle. Um, but And obviously, she won't have a shot at the white belt because she'll have lost in the tournament. So I do see the point. Um she could challenge for the SWA, but that seems like a little bit of a step down, especially as they did such a good job of building her up and putting her in that match with Momo and Mayu. It's difficult. Um, I imagine she's probably going to stay in the tag division for a little bit longer. And then, yeah, I don't really know. <laughs> I think she's going to default to feuding with Tora, because Tora did hang her. Yes, that is true. And no one likes to be hung in a wrestling ring. No, it's not great. May apart Mayu from, apart from Mayu, yeah, Mayu loves it. <laughs> Every fucking match. Every match. Just like, you have no respect <laughs> for your throat and dog. But, um, yeah, I, I think she's going to feed with Tora for a while just because, you know, she she was hanged. But, yeah, after that, I'm, I'm not sure. She could always default. She's one of those people, like, like what Christian was, where you could just throw in a title program and no one's really going to question it. Do you ever see Konami getting the red belt at the moment? Maybe at the moment, no. In a, in a few years, maybe like once she has a 
Because, like, her problem right now is sort of Sonata, where, like, she doesn't always show emotion, which is, why, again, why I think Julia is a good one, because, like, as much as people don't like her, she's fairly expressive. So, I, I'm not sure. I'm I'm really not sure. It's kind of like why Hannah and Jungle were a good fit for her, because, like, they sort of forced you to have a personality. Who do you think? So, just before, again, we get into the main event, assuming... I mean, if I put you on the spot now and asked you, right, does Jungle take the belt on the 24th? Do you say yes or no? Just yes or no? Yes. You think she takes it? Yes. Okay. In which case, do you think that Utami and Saya, who we've praised, do you think they take the tag belts? Possibly. And then, like, maybe Utami... Because Utami and Jungle have an eternal feud, so maybe Utami pins Jungle and then that sets up a Jungle challenge. Yeah, okay, I can see that. Yeah, I can see that. Um, So let's get into the main event then of the Corican show, and that was the other semi-final of the Wonder of Stardom title tournament, uh, and that was Tam Nakano defeating Natsuka Tora in 12 minutes and 42 seconds. I'm going to let you go first, Chris, because I think that we differ wildly on our opinion of this match. Um, I enjoyed this match. Uh, this... Um... At the start, it was Oedetai bollocks, but like it made sense because Oedetai now have a co- have a go- come and go and that's get Natsuki to the next round. Um, Tam fought against it well when we got back into the ring. Um, after she was hanged, she just sort of was like, nah, none of this shit, and like started kicking the shit out of um, Torah, which I'll never not be here for. Um, I do think the middle kind of dragged, like with the like. The three minutes of many splashes just didn't need to happen. Like, the two splashes were fine. It felt like they, they realised they went too fast and had to kill a bit more time. This was a weird one. I did enjoy it, but I don't think it's blow away by any means. Tam wins. One, one moment, moment I did like with Tam was she hits a tiger suplex. No, dragon, tiger suplex. Yeah, tiger, no, I, I'm bad. Yeah, it's tiger suplex. And... Um, couldn't bridge because she had her ribs were still hurting from both the splashes and the being thrown into the barricade. So like she had to resort to a roll up, which I thought was quite good. It keeps Tora looking strong. It takes time through to the next round with a handicap against a tweener like Julia. So it it plays well into the story, especially since Julia is naturally going to be the heel because Tam's fighting for a fallen friend. So, I just I found it really dull and <laughs> the problem was and I've said this before the problem is that we had a very very single type of match and that's what Tora has fought the last three shows and it was very very similar um, I do appreciate what you've said about how uh, Tam's back played into later on in the show or later on in the match should I say where obviously she took the chair shots and then took uh, being thrown into the barricade like she'd had her spine removed. Um, I thought that was really good, how it then figured into the Tiger Suplex later on. It just it was another one that dragged, and I think when this match only went 12 minutes, and it, f- it did feel like it went longer, I just I couldn't get invested. And I don't know whether it's because I can't get past Oida Tide just looking, rather than looking like badass heels, just looking like dorks. I don't know whether it's that or whether it's the fact that I just don't find Natsukatora in the ring interesting or whether it's because Tam and Tora just didn't have the chemistry I thought they were going to have. It, there was just something about this match that I didn't like. And again, we had the chain strike and, you know, the ascension. It was just a repeat spot and it seemed to be cut and paste and it seems to be the same for everything with Oida Tai at the moment. Now, that doesn't mean say this is a bad match. I don't think it was a bad match. I gave it six, but I had issue with the fact that it was the main event and I had issue with the fact that it dragged massively in the middle. Those are my issues with it. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I th- I think it's a high six or seven. Um, I d- I did enjoy it. I didn't hate. I didn't like hate it. I do agree about the middle part where Tora kept setting up time splashes did drag. 
What I did like was um, she used the finish um, from the Shinkiba show um, to set up the fact that Tora might win with that same finish. I did like that. Um, so then, like, it was legitimately nice when Tam kicked out of that. But, like, it's after that, the match dragged for about two minutes, which in a 12 minute ma- match isn't an insignificant amount of its runtime. So, like, I'm not saying this is like a great match or anything. It's just. It's fine, like it, it's inoffensive. I do agree it probably shouldn't have main evented. But I think it literally did main event because Tam's just a bigger face than Julia. And like Tam is a much better option to have end the night than Julia, because you sort of seen a lot of the time when Julia has to end the night. Her promos do die at death, especially in Corican. Yeah, I think she had good chemistry with Tam when it came to the end. I thought, you know, you'd got Tam Nakano, who was channeling, it seemed, her inner Hiromu Takahashi and her full-on mental uh, promo, her full-on breakdown of how she wasn't going to give the belt to uh, to Julia and how Julia just basically looked at her and just walked off, which I thought was very funny. Um, I don't know, it's... It didn't seem... You think of all the Corican shows that I've seen since I've been watching Stardom, this was the weakest. It's definitely the worst. It's definitely probably the weakest. I, I, I enjoyed it more than Miss Cinderella, but that's because the way they went around booking Miss Cinderella actively annoyed me. I'm not I'm not a fan of um, take people out to make someone more sympathetic going into a tournament final. I've never really been into that. I think it's a bit of an overused device. So, like, for me, Cinderella is easily the weakest just because of that. But, like, yeah, in terms of, like, standard Corican main events, it's probably the weakest one. Maybe Saki versus May, but like May did her best with what she was given. Yeah. I, I was just, I felt very flat at the end of this. And of the three shows, the Corican one wasn't the one I thought to be flat on. Yeah, it's weird that like the second Shinkiba show ended up being the best show. I, I say that, we haven't seen the tag matches, but in terms of like main events, I preferred like the three top matches there as opposed to, the, actually, no, I preferred two of the top three matches there. Whereas, like, I think these three matches were more consistent just because they weren't aware that they tags. Again, again Tori wasn't sort of being chained down by her opponents. And again, like, she wasn't amazing here. She was still good. Yeah. Like, she's a good heel. And I think, given time, she could do better. But again, she's one of the older people on the roster. She's 29. I think that makes her the oldest person on the roster. Well, it doesn't. Death Yamasa. Oh, Death Yamasan. Yeah, but like she's like came from a coffin from Egypt or something. So, <laughs> is that the gimmick? <laughs> I hope so. Um, so let's let's put that to bed then, and let's look ahead to what Stardom have got planned over the next couple of shows. So the next Stardom show is the twenty third of July in Osaka, and that card is as follows: um, you have got singles match between Himika and Sayakamatani. Um, a singles match between Azumi and Death Yamasa, uh, a tag match between Starlight Kinsai Ida and Momo Watanabe and Yutami. Um, you've then got a tag match between Mayo and Tam versus Jungle and Konami. Um, and then the aforementioned Artist of Stardom Championship match with the champions Julia, Siori, and Micah taking on Tori. Uh, sorry, Natsu Katora, Saki Kashima, and Natsu Samir. Does anything jump out at you off that card, Chris? It all seems solid. It all seems fun enough. Like, it's a Nagoya show, so it's very rarely something bigger in Nagoya show. So, as a Nagoya cards go, I'm actually fine with this. This is Osaka, Nagoya is the day after. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, <laughs> same, same tends to go for Osaka as well. So. <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm with you 100%. I'm, I'm intrigued to see what Himika's like in the ring and singles competition. We talked about that earlier. She's got Saya. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'm always going to be down for um, Mayu and Tam versus Jungle and Konami. I think that's going to be great. Right, uh, it's going to be good. And then the tag match between uh, Starlight and say Ida versus Momo and Yutami, that's got the potential to be very, very, very good. Um, the towel match, I can take a leave. If it's the same match that they had on night one of Shinkiba, then I have absolutely no desire to see that whatsoever. But we'll see. We'll see, Chris. Um, yeah, um, weird, because the six-man tag belts are normally a fairly strong division because you have to put... They have to put like big faces in there, but unfortunately, right now, 
Um, oh, at the time, didn't really have any big faces. No, exactly. Um, moving on to Nagoya then, on Friday, the, uh, July 24th, we have got a tag team match with Rio and Tam Nakano taking on Natsu Katora and Natsu Samir. Uh, singles match, Saya Ida and Konami. Uh, a three-way between Saki Kashima, Starlight Kid and Death Yamasan. Uh, eight-man tag action, right, women tag action with Donna Del Mondo taking on Queen's Quest. And then finally, your main event of Nagoya is obviously the Red Belt defense, Mayu Ibutani taking on Jungle Kiona. Aside from the obvious main event, which is going to be, I've got very, very, very high hopes for that match. That could be a match of the year caliber match. Um, yeah. Um, last time Jungle got a singles title match. I, actually, every time Jungle gets a singles title match, she knocks out the pack. She's one of it's weird because like we compare her to Ishii a lot, where she's like popular but doesn't really get singles acclaim. But like I don't know, a lot of the time when Ishii gets singles matches outside the G1, well, they're really good. But he like I can't think of a Ishii not um, an Ishii title match that's completely blow away. Mm. No. Whereas like all. Oh, Whereas all of jungles are completely blow away, like Kagetsu, Momo, um, and Arisa, all completely blow away, all must watch. A um, couple of them, 10 out of 10. So, yeah, especially against May, who's having the run of their life right now. Um, like, you look at this run alone, like, Kagetsu was great. Um, Momo was obviously great. Um, Ihara, which you still haven't fucking seen, um, is amazing. So, yeah, this has no, like, on eight out of ten, I think it's the flaw here. It's very dangerous to say stuff like that because I could be disappointed. But, like, Jungle's amazing, so. Aside from that, I am quite looking forward to the eight-woman tag um, between Queen's Quest and Donna Del Mondo. I think that's got the the potential to be very, very good, um, especially when you look at who's involved there. You've got Utami, you've got Momo, you've got Mikey, you've got Himaki, you've got Julia Siori. You've got some really, really good names in there. Azumi, Saya. Um, I'm looking forward to that. So we then move ahead to the next Corican show, which is July the 26th, so Sunday. Uh, and that card is as follows. We have got Hina versus Saki Kashima. Uh, I assume that's not the main event, but, you know, never mind. Um, it's listed as such, but I assume not. Um, you have got a tag match between Death, Yamasan, and Rina taking on Natsu Katora and Natsu Samir. Uh, singles match between Mika and Momo Watanabe, which could be very, very interesting. Um, Siori and Himika taking on Mayu and Saya Ida. You've then got the high-speed championship match which is a three-way between champion Rio and the challenger starlight kid and azumi and then you've got two championship matches you have got the goddesses of stardom tag team championship match which we've already been through jungle kiona and konami taking on utami and saya kamatani and you have got the tournament final for the wonder of stardom belt between julia and tam nakano now I don't want to jinx it because I was a little bit disappointed with this time's um this sorry this um date at Corrigan. This date looks very very tasty. Yeah, it's that's a, that's a tasty, that's a, just a tasty card. Um, all the big matches have some kind of through line. The through line for the high speed championship being finally <laughs> Rio is defending. I hope she loses. Um, that main event is something that's been building since Cinderella, so I'm into that. Because especially in a pandemic, it's hard to get long built stories and a lot of the short built stories in several promotions. New Japan has felt fairly flat, so like I do have high. It's the first time I've had high hopes for a Julia match. Like I think it's the only match she's going to have in a while that has the potential to outdo her Hannah match. It's just I I hope I'm right. Um. And yeah, that tag match is unbelievably tasty. Like anytime you put Utami and Jungle in the ring, it's great. Stardom tag match of the year is um, does involve Jungle, so I I have nothing but high hopes for that match. Putting him on the spot again, then Chris. Um, high speed championship, Riho star like and Nazumi. Who who do you see? Not who do you want? Who do you see taking that belt? Azumi. 
yeah, I'm with you. I think it'll be Azumi as well. Um, tag championships. Um, Itami and Saya. Yeah, me too. This is good. <laughs> it's giving them no competitive element to it whatsoever. And finally, who do you have taking the Y belt? I assume we've both got the same person here. Julia. Yeah, one hundred percent. Um. I didn't ask you about uh, the Osaka show. Do you think Donna Del Mondo retained the Artists' Championships? Maybe. Do they want to do Julia T-Bounce? Well, if you think about it, that gives Donna Del Mondo, if everything that we've predicted comes to fruition, that gives them the Artists, the Future, and the Wonder. We've said that they're building them as dominant faction. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Um... So, yeah. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. We will be back to review the next Corican show, which is the 26th. So we'll be we'll be back as soon as they are on to Stardom World. We'll keep you informed on Twitter. Uh, until then, uh, thank you so much for listening. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We are literally everywhere. Uh, you can talk to us on Twitter at, at the Stardom Cast, and you can also find us on Facebook. Join the Facebook group at Podmania Podcasts. Um, you can also join our Discord server, which is buried in our Twitter feed. We'll send out another invite to that. Uh, lots and lots of good people, lots of good chat talking about Stardom and other promotions as well, so check that out. Um, you can talk to me on Twitter at, at Real Rob Goodwin. Chris, where can they find you? Microsoft Technical Support Scotland. <laughs> uh, are you leaving it at that yeah fair enough um, thank you so much for listening guys again we'll be back um, after the next Corican show until then talk to you guys again soon bye